Hello, and welcome back to the Burr Channel, where we talk about stories in movies, books, shows, and games, and I stream five days a week on twitch.tv slash ginsy. Today, we're going to take a look at the story in Shadow Hearts 2, or as it's rather known, Shadow Hearts Covenant. If you follow me on Twitter at all, you've already seen me bracing for this particular video. I like Covenant, but I don't like it nearly as much as I like the original Shadow Hearts. I want to emphasize that this game is still good and fun to me. Just not as good and fun as Shadow Hearts 1. Especially at the start of this video, I'm going to sound pretty negative, but I want you to keep in mind that I said this. I like this game, but not as much as Shadow Hearts 1. And I seem to be rather alone in that opinion. That has a few reasons, but to properly talk about the problems I have with this game, I will have to take you through the whole ride first. And fair warning, this is going to be a two-parter. And the second part is going to have a discussion about some of the, uh, let's say darker aspects that will probably get that video at the very least partially demonetized. But in this part, we'll keep things mostly lighthearted and start going through the story, which starts off from the bad ending of Shadow Hearts 1. If you haven't seen the first Shadow Hearts video, then I highly suggest you watch that one first. And in fact, the Kudelka video before that, because they're all part of the same storyline, and I won't re-explain things that already happened during those games. Now, without further ado, gather around the fire and let me tell you a tale. As with the other videos, I'm going to come spoiling right out the gate. If you are at all interested in playing this game and going in blind, I'd save this video for afterwards. Despite my multiple complaints here, I do want to recommend the game because it's an enjoyable, light-hearted romp for the most part, and it's received quite a few quality of life improvements since the last installment. Like Shadow Hearts, we get a lot of characters who are more than they appear at first, which is why I'm going to introduce each at least marginally important character first so it's easier to follow along. You might not think this is going to be a very long chapter, but I'm going to use this time to air some grievances with the characters at the same time. Covenant takes place during World War I, the terrible times Shadow Hearts 1 ended with. Yuri is still the protagonist of the series for now. He's basically the same Yuri as before, except since they've made the game more slapstick and a lot more scenes are fully voice acted, he's also taken on a more jokey demeanor himself. With the bad ending for Shadow Hearts being the canon ending, he's fresh off burying the woman he loves, Alice, and now hangs around a small town in France, Domremy. It's not clear why he chose that town in particular, but he's taken it upon himself to protect it from the Germans. With Alice gone, we need a new female protagonist as well, and that's Karen. I'm going to immediately spoil part of the ending of this game for you right here and now. You've been warned. I do not like Karen's character at all. I think she's wasted potential, and the plot twist involving her is honestly disturbing and filled with plot holes. Karen is a lieutenant in the German army. She didn't really want to join the army, but she has a fallen family and a sick grandmother. You know how it is. Right at the start of the game, however, she meets Yuri, and from that point forward, her only character trait is that she loves Yuri. I really wish I was joking, but the extent of her interactions range from slapping men who ogle her to sternly huffing when she's not fawning over Yuri. Having a female German army officer in your team opens up a world of interesting character developments, you'd think, but we get none of that. And it made me a little sad to see this poor woman becoming arm candy from the very first moment we meet her. It's extra weird because the Western version of the Covenant box art prominently features Karen. In fact, she's the only character on the box, especially coming off a character like Alice who, while she loved Yuri, had her own motivations to go on their particular adventure, her father's killer, the fact she felt a genuine obligation to make the world a better place. She stood on her own as a character, just as much as she made Yuri a better character alongside her. And Karen simply doesn't. All right, Karen, tell me a little about yourself. Well, I'm German, uh, I'm in the army and I care about my grandmother. Uh-huh, all right. And I like men. Likes, I'm sorry? I like men. Is, is, is that a character trait you want to go with? Yes, I think so. All right, very brave, very brave. What else? That's pretty much it. John! 
John, do we need a blank slate? Uh, I could use one or two! All right, you're hired. Now, when it comes to Karen's plot twist, she's Yuri's mother. Yes, you heard that right. The woman who fawns over Yuri for the entirety of the game is actually his mother. Because this game, you guessed it, revolves around time travel too. By the end of the game, the characters have the option to travel to a time and place of their choosing, and Karen, unwittingly, wishes to go back in time far enough to meet Jinpachiro Hiyuga, Yuri's dad. She was at this point aware that Yuri's love for Alice was irreplaceable, so her heart secretly wished for the next best thing, I guess, which was his dad. How does that work, I hear you ask? It doesn't. When I tell you the entire story of the game, I'm going to point out several problems with this particular twist, but even going off just Shadow Hearts and how it played out, you should know it's a bad idea. And to be fair, time travel usually is, but this also feels very icky. We've been flirting with our mom. I want to go home now. Leaving Karen aside for a moment, we also have a new team to hang out with. The first two characters we recruit alongside Karen are Geppetto and Blanca. Geppetto is an old puppeteer and Alice was his niece. That's why he's hanging out with Yuri in the first place. His weapon of choice is a puppet called Cornelia, who was based on his dead daughter. I feel like Geppetto is an interesting enough character, even though we don't really get much information on him outside of his side quest. He's your stereotypical wise old man person. Blanca, on the other hand, is a white wolf and initially a pet for Jeanne, a little girl who lives in Domremy. Circumstances eventually split them up and Blanca joins Yuri and the gang. Blanca is mostly a pure slapstick character who pulls weird poses and talks to other wolves in a human voice. There's not much else to say about him. But to be fair, that's all he really needs. For me, most of his slapstick landed pretty well, especially because his dog conversations are so weirdly serious. Our next addition is Joachim Valentine, and he's my favorite character because he's the most expressive. Unfortunately, he's also what I have to talk about in part two of this two-parter, because Joachim is gay, and the game will not ever let you forget that. Remember the golden bat from Keith's castle in the previous game? This is him. He's Keith's older brother. He poses as the Grand Papillon, champion of truth and justice, his superhero and wrestler persona, and his weapon of choice is literally whatever he can find. Throughout the game, you can find items on the floor that pique his interest, and at that point he just picks it up and starts wielding it, from a mailbox to a frozen tuna, and eventually a miniature tower and an equally miniature Nautilus submarine. And yes, he's also a pure slapstick character. Next, we pick up Lucia, and Lucia is once again extremely empty as characters go. Funny how that's the two female characters so far. She lays tarot cards, mixes aromas, and dances. She's also the one who unleashed this absolute meme scene. That is one giant pussy. Lucia is unfortunately very boring otherwise. After her introduction, she generally just giggles like an airhead and hides in the background. She gets little to no development, and her special ability involving tarot cards can backfire like mad. And I really mean that. Each card she pulls can have a reversed effect, so you might restore all your allies' mana points, or you reduce them to zero. If you're extremely unlucky, you pull the Lover's card, which has the potential to instantly kill your entire party. Actually, the Chariot does that too. And Justice. And Death. I'm telling you not to use her tarot abilities unless you're feeling very lucky that particular day. I never used her in my party unless the game forced me to, which it unfortunately does in certain situations. Eventually, we also pick up Princess Anastasia Romanov. Yes, that one. I find her extremely annoying, but at least she has a character, which is nice. She's also 14, so she has to act like a child, which she definitely pulls off. Her entire deal is that she's short-tempered and expects to always get what she wants. She also kicks dogs. Happy. <laughs> huh? <laughs> but 
but she's also brave and inventive, so it somewhat balances out. Her scenes just aren't generally very endearing. She uses a camera to take pictures of enemies so we can see their stats, and she sometimes captures them inside a photograph to use in battle later. She also develops an immediate crush on the 17-year-old final party member, Kurando. And yes, they do end up engaged by the end of this game. Engaged. Let that sink in. And if you throw, well, that was normal in those times at me right now, you're telling on yourself. She is Princess Anastasia Romanov. <laughs> Aww. Kurando is Yuri's cousin. Honestly, it's easy enough to call when you meet him the first time because who else has naturally red eyes? His mother, Saki, is Jimpachiro's sister. And as such, she and Kurando both also have fusion abilities. Albeit not as powerful as Yuri, his character is that of the thoughtful swordsman stereotype. And that's honestly it. We don't really get much more information on him. And that concludes the playable character cast. However, there are a few other characters I need to talk about. Three of them are characters that changed strangely from one game to the next. The first of them is Roger Bacon. He was never a very serious character, of course, but he always struck me as the highly intelligent individual hiding behind the facade of a fool. When we first meet him in Kudelka, he's stuck in a tomb and only just woke up. He clearly knows a lot and finds himself largely stuck in the library, feverishly looking for information, eventually finding the information our team needs. In Shadow Hearts 1, we find him again, and he certainly slapsticked it up a little tricking us into trying to name him, breaking the fourth wall as the only character in the game to do so, and the only time he does so. He collects dirty magazines now, and plays the lottery. But he still felt like the same guy, the fool's facade. Yeah, that fully dropped in Covenant. Roger Bacon is a Muppet now. Yes, I said it, a Muppet. I can't be kinder than that. He's once again a slapstick character. He has a few lines where he's allowed to be serious, but largely, his character is this. No, that's not it. It's Roger Bacon! Yes, master philosopher, alchemist, and eternal love cat! Oh! Oh, it's terrible. If we don't do something, there'll be another terrible tragedy. <laughs> uh, I wasn't about to die until I could give you all a piece of my mind! Okay! <laughs> Time to let bygones be bygones. She's right. Let's just forget it. <laughs> I suppose to counteract the fact that the characters surrounding him had become more slapstick, the marginally slapstick character from the previous games had to really up the ante. Another character that's been changed is Cardinal Albert Simon. What? I hear you ask loudly behind your computer screen. But I thought he was dead. And he is. Somewhat. Covenant retconned his death. And also his new model reminds me of the controller in Thomas the Tank Engine. In Shadow Hearts 1, to get the Amon fusion, you had to collect a specific stone and then defeat Albert. You obtain Amon after the fight. Then Albert runs off and you fight him again later where he uses the last of his strength and dies. Covenant says, no, actually, Albert didn't do that. He fused with Yuri after Yuri obtained Amon. So now Albert's soul is hanging out in Yuri's heart for the most part. Through him, you reobtain Amon and eventually an upgraded version of Amon. And when you talk to him every so often, he seems like the uh, nice, understanding grandpa type. And this is where, alongside the characters, I'm going to introduce an organization or rather a cult. It's it's not a very good cult. John? John! What? Do we want a cult in our game? Of course we want a cult. Cult. Check. But not too much. What does that mean? I mean, mention the cults, but it doesn't really do that much. Well, what's the point of the cult then? To sound menacing. Uh-huh. Sapientus Gladio. I hate that man. Sapientes Gladio. This name is going to come up several times during the game and several bad guys are part of it. Albert Simon was also a part of it. In fact, he was one of the main guys when a man named Jovis created the entire endeavor. 
When the cult started, it was extremely wholesome and everyone just wanted to sing Kumbaya all day until an evil man joined and took over. That evil man, called Rasputin, yes, that one, turned the Sapientes Gladio cult, hereafter called the cult, elitist. They started executing people that stood in their way in horrible ways. Remember when Albert Simon was the main bad guy in Shadow Hearts 1? And he wanted to basically kill all human life so we could start over? Okay, so actually he only did that because he was helping. You see, destroying the world would stop the cults. Rasputin was always his true enemy, you see? <laughs> don't! Are you starting to notice what my main problem with this game's story is? Oh, don't worry, there is so much more. Albert has just been sent to retcon hell. In the first game, we learn that he grew up very poor and was extremely idealistic, so the church threw him out, and that turned him bitter. So how would Albert, at that point, join the extremely wholesome cult that wanted to sing Kumbaya? Was he bitter or wasn't he? Also, he horribly butchered Alice's father that one time, and I quote, his body lay scattered in pieces as if savaged by a beast. Does that sound like a guy who is just trying his best to make the world a better place? Or that other time when he decided to torture Kudelka's son in front of her? Very lovely, indeed. Oh, and another time when he kidnapped Wugwai to experiment on his corpse with black magic so he could practice animating humans he liked for when he made a new world. Or the time he cackled evilly as a god was summoned who destroyed an entire city. Albert is just so nice. Not to mention that Roger Bacon apparently knows about the cult, but never told us about it in the first game. And yes, Albert was technically of the belief that he was doing it all for the greater good, but uh, no. This man was also just not a good person. Actions speak louder than words, and he had a lot of very loud, very brutal actions. Anyway, there's still a third person, but we'll get to him. First, let me tell you about Nicholas Conrad. Yes, the character chapter is a long one. Nicholas Conrad, usually called Nikolai, is the first bad guy we meet. When we meet him, he actually isn't a bad guy yet, unless you read his profile, in which case the game cheats and spoils that part for you. He pretends to be a nice priest who just wants to help, but actually he holds the soul of Astaroth, the god of fear and chaos, inside of him. And he's also the illegitimate son of the Tsar of Russia, and a part of the cult, and his ultimate goal is to become the Tsar of Russia himself by killing everyone on the way there. He's fun. And no, I do mean that. I think Nikolai is a fun character, because he's a bit loopy, but somewhat suave, which is why I'm annoyed that the game pretends he's the main antagonist when he's not really. There are too many antagonists in this game to really focus on anything, but Nikolai is the most fun. He has that devious energy that makes you really want to slap him, but also you sort of want to know where he's going with this, that I appreciate in villains. Another villain we deal with is Rasputin. He's the leader of the cult, as I mentioned, and he also adopted Nikolai at one point, purely because he thought he was useful, of course. Rasputin is the third person to form a pact with a demon outside of Nikolai and Yuri. He's fused with Asmodeus, god of desire. His whole deal is that he wants to rule the entirety of Europe and maybe the world? And then there's Kato. A lot of people might go, who? On that one too. Kato was the aide of Yoshiko Kawashima, the Japanese army lady from the previous game. Remember how she died in the end and Kato was very much in love with her? In this game, we're going to pretend like Kato and Yuri were very close friends, even though they really weren't at all, because Kato is the true end boss in this game. I hate him. Initially, he takes DNA from the dead Yoshiko so he can clone her in his Japanese army lab, which he does successfully. He creates three mutant apes in total, and the Yoshika mutant ape is called Oka. She looks like Yoshiko, but with slightly enlarged <clears throat> assets, and even sounds like her, except she calls him master, and also at one point she disobeys orders to save her friends, which prompts Kato to slap her in the face and threaten her with death if she ever disobeys again. Truly a love story for the ages. Oka eventually dies, of course, sacrificing herself for Kato, at which point Kato decides that the world is no longer worth it, so he'll destroy it and send himself back in time a hundred years in the past, because all the bad people of today weren't born yet at that point. No, Kato, you're right, we had entirely unique bad people instead. His plan sucks. 
But those were all the characters I felt I had to talk about to start off. Yes, to start off. You did see the length of this part one of two videos, I'm sure. Covenant is a lot longer than the first Shadow Hearts, which was around 25 hours of nearly 40 if you did everything there was to do, which I did. I decided to do the same in Covenant, which is nearly 40 hours in general, or 60-ish, give or take, if you do every single thing, which I did. I might not sleep, but at least I'm thorough. So let's get ourselves through the story from start to finish, so we can talk about it properly. The story in Covenant in terms of story beats and overall feel isn't that much different from the first Shadow Hearts. The main difference is the lack of horror elements. Don't get me wrong, they still exist, but they're a lot sparser. Apparently the team got quite a bit of feedback after the first game and they took it to heart. People felt the game was too dark and too disturbing, which angers me because that is one of the reasons I like those types of games. But the team decided to adopt more slapstick in the sequel and hilariously declined to continue off the good ending for Shadow Hearts 1 because Yuri and Alice as a happily married couple didn't fit the serious tone of the game, which is somewhat ironic given the sudden change in atmosphere. Hey, so you know how we made that Kudelka game that was kind of grim, but with a tinge of humor and excellent voice acting? Yes, John, what about it? And then Shadow Hearts became kind of goofy anime in their humor, but still really dark and bad voice acting? Uh-huh. Can we just make Shadow Hearts 2 anime altogether? Uh, keep the bad voice acting? Moderately bad, at the very least. I'll let you get on that. Oh, but could you still add the weirdly morbid references? My kids love those. Uh, you mean like a book that contains the means to summon the most powerful lords of hell? Exactly like that! And maybe some S&M and a World War I setting? And perhaps the occasional extremely offensive stereotypes and... Uh, let's say a Lovecraftian horrors. You got it! Okay, never mind. I'm leaving this in your extremely capable hands. Anyway. Hi, Josephine. Listen, John's messing with my game again. Yeah, that John. I, I need you and the team to uh, study Dragon Quest for a while and also kidnap whoever came up with the Broodmother concept in Dragon Age Origins so they can inspire you from a distance. Don't get me wrong, Yuri's arc and ending is definitely serious, but the game itself and the character interactions largely are not. It feels very much like they wanted to let Yuri rest after this game was over, which they succeeded in, and I feel like, depending on how you explain the ending, they did a very good job with that. I will talk more about the ending in part 2, of course, but the good ending is, from my point of view, the best possible outcome for him in this case, and in theory, even makes the good ending in Shadow Hearts 1 canon, in a way. I enjoyed it very much indeed. However, if you're going into this game expecting a genuine Shadow Hearts 1 Part 2, you are going to be somewhat disappointed in a few ways, but delighted in various others. But before we get to the end, we have to actually talk about the start. Covenant begins in Dom Remy, with Karen and her German squad attacking and getting soundly defeated by Yuri in his Amon form. Karen is forced to explain what happened to her superiors, of course, and is subsequently asked to accompany Nikolai to Dom Remy so he can exercise Yuri. In order to do that, however, we first visit Apoina Tower, a place that holds all the malice of the world, like a big, towery Pandora's box. So we can pick up an item called the Mistletoe, while Karen waxes nostalgically about the big Amon demon who was sad but beautiful. Mistletoe in hand, we leave for Dom Remy to confront Yuri where it is revealed that Nikolai is actually evil. He brought his own gang of soldiers to kill the German soldiers Karen brought because he wanted to deal with Yuri alone. Why that is, is never explained. His plan is very stupid. The reason Nikolai doesn't like Yuri is because Yuri killed Space God in the last game and that was supposed to be Nikolai's job. That was his Space God, dang it. So of course Karen turns on Nikolai here because this isn't what she signed up for, so Nikolai exclaims that she'll just have to die too. Remember this moment. Yuri is unfortunately stabbed by the mistletoe, cursing him to eventually lose his memory entirely and become an empty shell of a human being. It also seals away all of his fusions from Shadow Hearts 1. Convenient. 
As Yuri faints, we get a small flashback of Yuri in Dom Remy hanging out with Geppetto and Jeanne, the little girl who owns Blanca. They argue about what to do next, and Yuri seems intent on just hanging out here when darkness engulfs him and we're shown an evil Amon who killed both Blanca and Jeanne. In the real world, Jeanne was indeed dead, killed by the Germans. Yuri wakes up in a cave with a few survivors, Karen, Geppetto, and Blanca, who had dragged Yuri to safety. They set off to leave the forest and make decent headway until Yuri collapses and enters his mind graveyard. The mind graveyard was changed quite a bit. It isn't really a graveyard anymore, it's more just an empty space with a tree in the middle. A second Yuri is growing out of the tree, symbolizing the mistletoe curse. Yuri's soul and memory are locked within the tree, slowly devoured as time passes. Inside the graveyard, we'll meet Jeanne throughout the game. Jeanne, the little girl from Dom Remy, died, of course, but her spirit refused to move on and instead has a small chat with Yuri from time to time when he visits the graveyard. She's trying to help him, trying to solve the problem of the curse. Regardless, the graveyard is still the hub from which you upgrade your fusion powers, so we unlock our first fusion and this action spawns a monster in the waking world. After quickly dispatching it, we finally make it to Geppetto's house in Paris, where Karen gets a new, extremely battle-ready attire. and we unlock various side stories. The plan now is to travel to Le Havre and get a boat to Wales in order to find Roger Bacon, who might know more about the cult. Sneaking through the subway tunnels, we fight our way through Lenny, who is technically a bad guy, but mostly he's a slapstick character once again. <laughs> And we also fight Veronica, who is an SNM mistress. Yes, really, before we find ourselves in Le Havre. In Le Havre, it turns out the boat requires money, which the game pretends we don't have, so we have to make a deal with the mayor to guard the town at night. Except the mayor turns out to be a crook. This is where we meet Joachim Valentine. Joachim is defending a small store from the grubby paws of the mayor. And after finding out the truth, we beat up the mayor and take his lunch money only for the mayor to kidnap some children Joachim had befriended. Except then Veronica shows up to beat up the mayor too, so she can take the children hostage instead? You still following me here? Long story short, we beat up Veronica and take her lunch money, and her kids, and Joachim is officially recruited. Finally in Southampton, it's raining cats and dogs, so we seek shelter in the local inn where we finally run into Kato. He's in the Navy now, and a diplomat. He's also very mysterious now, so the audience can deduce he may be a bad guy, which he is. The day after, we fight through the Ronda mines, which eventually lead to Wales at last. But unfortunately, Roger isn't home. Little did we know, he'd already been kidnapped by the cult a while ago. Thankfully, slapstick Lenny shows up to tell us where to find him, and after we beat him up, we're also approached by a man named Thomas. That isn't his real name, but never you mind that for now. He's here to do exposition, give us a new lead in Florence, Italy, and then disappear. In Italy, we find Lucia and Carla. Carla used to be a part of the cult, and because she chose to leave them, she's hunted by them. Thinking we're a part of the cult sent to kill her, she sends us on a fool's errand with Lucia in tow. Lucia was meant to kill us, of course, through the use of... Uh, well, in case you forgot. That is one giant pussy. Anyway, the pink pussy called Andre rejects reality and substitutes it by trying to eat Lucia, and after we save her, she's fully on our side, joining the party. We return to Carla, hear her story, and leave for the cult's local headquarters, where we hope to find Roger, but alas, he's already gone again. Nikolai tells us so after he blasts part of the wall away and yells at us from atop his blimp. He'd give us Roger back if we gave him the Emigre manuscript. Yuri is not very bright, and decides that finding the manuscript at this point is a good idea. So we traipse back to the name ruins and pick up our book. Book in hand, we leave for St. Marguerite Island, where Roger is supposed to be held. And honestly, if we already knew that, why even bring the book? 
At the island, we are overwhelmed by slapstick. Our key gets stolen by wolves, we get locked up by Veronica, who wants to play S&M games with us, and Blanca has his own little doggy stealth game going on to free us. Once freed, we find Roger, who is impersonating the man in the iron mask. We fight Lenny for the right to keep the lad, and of course we win, so Roger gets to repeat the try to name this character joke he already did in Shadow Hearts 1, and we leave together. Roger unloads a whole heap of exposition on us and then shows us his super-powered airship called the Bacon Jet, which we fly to Petrograd, Russia, to confront Grigory Rasputin. But before that happens, we get to confirm that Rasputin had a rough night of... exercise? With Veronica? And he's not interested in tonight's ball for some reason. In the segment after this cutscene, we play as Anastasia Romanov, trying to collect evidence that Rasputin is up to something. Evidence she finds when she takes a picture of Rasputin meeting with an assassin. Unfortunately for her, Rasputin notices her and sends a monster after her, which is only barely stopped by Yuri and the gang when they hear her scream. They quickly figure out they're working against the same person and plot to get everyone into the palace together, but when they arrive in a strange twist of fate, Rasputin is the only reason they're allowed to hang around. Obviously, he has a trap set already. After Anastasia heaps Rasputin's backstory on us, priest from Siberia, healed Alexei, her brother the prince, took over politics and so forth, Veronica puts a sleeping spell on the palace, and Rasputin kidnaps Alexei. When we rush over to save the prince from Rasputin's grasp, however, we walk right into his trap. He reveals his pact with Asmodeus, which grants him an extremely powerful shield. He mind controls Anastasia to make it seem like she was about to kill Alexei, only for the Tsarina to walk in right at that moment, which snaps her out of it. Rasputin immediately throws the blame for the mind control onto Yuri, forcing us to grab Anastasia and run off into the sunset. Specifically, we run off to the Goremi Valley in Turkey to find the ex-leader of the cult, Jovis. We also meet Thomas again, who isn't really called Thomas, but Edward Lawrence, a British spy. He gets us an audience with Jovis, who tells Yuri he better unseal his Amon fusion right quick, because without it, we can't beat Rasputin's shield. To do this, Yuri and Karen enter Yuri's mind graveyard to say hello to Jeanne and open one of the previously locked doors, behind which we find a castle that contains Amon. And also Albert, who is now a kind old gentleman. <laughs> When we return to the waking world, it turns out this little ritual took too much out of Jovis, and he's dying. In, in fact, he dies completely. Yuri is very hung up about it, but time waits for no one, so before he leaves, Jovis tells Yuri about Astaroth, who we don't know is fused with Nikolai yet. And then we leave for Petrograd again. Sneaking through a super secret underground entrance, we find ourselves in the palace where we're just in time to stop the Tsar from getting assassinated so Anastasia can present him with the evidence of Rasputin's misdeeds. Rasputin understandably takes off, but after a bit of legwork and after punching Veronica in her personalities, we get a neat little cutscene where Rasputin attempts to escape on his blimp-type flying machine, and Yuri transforms into Amon to beat the ever-living crap out of both Blimp and Rasputin. Unfortunately for us, that just means Rasputin lets Asmodeus take over his body completely who immediately summons a weird floaty castle, because that's just what demon gods do. Nikolai visits him in his floaty castle for a bit to tell him how super boned he is, because Nikolai has Astaroth, and also Yuri is very strong, so that's nice of him. Speaking of Nikolai, Karen has a dream about him, where he seemingly invades her dream world to tell her he loves her and should join him instead. This was never developed. Remember that scene I told you to remember when Nikolai said Karen would just have to die for siding with Yuri? I guess he changed his mind and now loves her. Karen obviously turns him down and we move on to Idar Flam, creepy floaty building to confront Rasputin. What do you think I'm here for? Bite me. No, you will bite me. And I'll tell you all about that in part two, of course. For now, thank you for watching and until another tale finds us. Hi, Josephine. Yeah, it's John here. So I have a few new concepts for party members. 
I wanted to run them by you. So, so hear me out. Uh, they're, they're good ones. Trust me, this time they're good ones. Uh, wool guy, right? The flying birdman. What do you mean all birds fly that isn't special? Yes, it is! This one breathes fire! It's different, Josephine. It's... Fine. Robertson. His whole deal is that he's actually a shark. No, no, listen. I, I like animal themes. And sharks aren't supposed to be on land, so it's quirky. It's quirky, Josephine. I can't work with you sometimes. How about a tag team? Can we do a tag team? Septic and cool stuff. Twin sword jugglers. Right? Right? Yeah. No, I thought you'd like that one. Yeah, and then the swords are actually gummy worms that recite the musical cats. What? No. No, no, no. We keep the gummy worm. A group concept? Can we do a group con- Josephine, don't get so hung up on the gummy worms. We'll do a group concept, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Power Rangers type thing, maybe? Right? The fighting evil together, yeah? No, I thought so. Uh, uh, Adrian Packle, the giraffe. Mike Zvears, the panda. Uh, Ray Ray, the walking stick. And Freeman, the birdman, team up to fight evil. No. No. no, see, the stick man is good for stealth. You don't see him. No, it's not the flying birdman. This one doesn't fly, and he doesn't breathe fire. He pecks people's eyes out in a gruesome manner. Giraffes and pandas are naturally dangerous, Josephine.